On this horror timeline, we are continuing with the How Bad Could It Be series, and I am watching some of the worst possible series that I could find. I know that we're being instructed to stay at home right now, but for the purpose of this video, we're heading over to England to check out the Robert the Doll series. Now, no one has requested this series. Uh, I'm pretty sure that quite a few of you hadn't even heard of this series. I hadn't heard of this series until I was researching some terrible series to watch, and I discovered it. So I guess it's time to find out how bad could it be? The Robert the Doll Cinematic Universe began a long time ago, way back in 2015, with Poltergeist Activity, which didn't actually feature Robert, but just kind of showed him in the credits. But that was followed very shortly with 2015's Robert, or Robert the Doll, who looks like this. It's fair to say that they took some liberties with the likeness of the doll as the real life version looked like this. You see, this film series is actually based on a true life haunting of a real doll called Robert, which is now located in a glass box in Key West, Florida, that is said to be evil. After a short intro, it cuts to three years later and Agatha here gets fired, so she unleashes the doll. She tells Jean that he'll be his best friend, you might say, his friend to the end. And he's a masterpiece of subtlety. There's no way that you could see this doll and think that he's something that someone would actually make as a real doll instead of just a horror movie prop. Pretty soon some terrifying things happen. Sugar spills, paint smears, just, just terrifying. He pushes the new nanny down the stairs, and at first, she lands with no blood, but don't worry, because some will magically appear, because that's how head wounds work. She didn't even hit her head there. Martha. Uh. Then, as a testament to the amazing writing, after their second babysitter dies in the space of two days, the husband still doesn't think that something is going on, because that's how dads work in this universe. They find out about the doll's past and is possessed by an evil spirit, and Robert hits Dad with a baseball bat. He hits him hard enough to knock him out, and his head's bloody, but... Earlier, they did a close-up of the bat, and it's clearly plastic. You can see the seam down the side. Mom faces off against Robert and resists the urge to kick him because the movie would then just be over. There's no reason not to kick him. He's not fast like Chucky. He's not like running around. He's just standing there walking slowly. Just <clears throat> kick him. Dad does something. I can't quite tell what he does. He throws something, maybe. Oh, oh, it's a knife. Uh, he throws a knife. Then it's three weeks later, and I guess they loved Robert so much that they left his picture up on the fridge even after he tried to kill them. Unfortunately, the evil spread to young Gene, and he kills his dad because someone saw Halloween 4. There's no visible date in this one, so let's roll with real-time 2015 for now. So, as you can imagine, demand was huge for a sequel, so just one year later we get 2016's The Curse of Robert the Doll. It starts with Robert being stolen from an evidence lockup, and then a voiceover that talks about a curse on the doll, and then we meet young Emily, who takes a night job at a museum. One of the exhibits is Robert, which is weird since it was stolen from a police evidence locker. And they even vaguely mentioned the events of the first movie and say that no one believes it, so it was, it was publicized. But here's the doll, just sitting in this museum case. He claims his first victim through paper bag strangulation, and even though they said earlier in the film that there's cameras there, I guess there's no footage at all of this occurring? Robert's way more active in this one, popping up and killing someone with a screwdriver, and the police investigate. And Emily even says that the doll's involved and no one makes the connection to the previous murders. We find out Jennifer from the last one was committed, so some time has passed, and I think a year sounds fair, so we're in real time 2016 then. So it turns out that the museum head switched the tapes, but he's killed, as is young Kevin here, and Robert literally doesn't move. It it's not a special effect, it's just a puppet that doesn't really move at all. It's pretty hilarious, actually. For some reason, he's meat on the inside, which probably someone should have noticed at some point. It was the focal point of a police investigation into multiple murders. But I guess not. 
Emily gets blamed for the murders and Robert goes missing, and they talked about him earlier, but in the last bits, Agatha's brother shows up, who I guess is the one who put the evil spirit into Robert? And he's, I, is he supposed to be an old man and not a man in a really bad old man mask? I hope not, because this in no way looks remotely real. They even do a little Robert will be back thing at the end and telling us that he'll return in The Toymaker. Well, these films are actually pretty successful in England, so one year later that happened with Robert and the Toymaker, which kicks off in Germany back in 1941. Okay, so let's see. Annabelle, doll in a glass case, check. Um, little boy who gets blamed for the doll's murders because nobody believes the little boy, child's play, check. Hmm, and now we have the third movie, which takes us back to World War II Germany. Hmm. Andre Toulon? After a group of Nazis kill the Hoffman family, a scenario that takes up close to half an hour of the film's runtime, but is actually pretty well written, I guess, as far as this series' standards, a book they stole winds up in the hands of the Toymaker. He's in the same terrible old age makeup as in the last film, and it doesn't make a lot of sense since this would be about 75 years before that one. He uses the book to bring Robert to life, telling the story of how his previous owner, a boy named Robert, was killed by his father, and he felt his soul lives on in it all. The toy maker animates other dolls as well, but is then kidnapped. Robert and the other dolls team up to save him and kill themselves some Nazis, and I'm not quite sure how Robert is supposed to be holding this knife. It's like it's just in his hand, like it's just taped on or something which it is. And let's talk some more about this makeup. Why did they have a young guy playing an old man and cover him in makeup to make him look old when it's just so unconvincing? I mean, just hire an older actor or have the character be younger. There's really no script reason for this character to be elderly, so I have no clue why this is the direction that they went. Well, he dies, but the dolls bring him back to life. I thought for like a second that this was going to be the purpose for the old age makeup, like they're going to restore him back to life and he would be restored back to his youth and they'd take the makeup off and he'd be young again, but n no, I gave the film too much credit. Then we get another promise at the end that the toy maker will return in The Legend of Robert the Doll. Well, I guess that title didn't really sit well because one year later we actually got 2018's Revenge of Robert the Doll. It starts off in 1939, two years earlier than the last film, and we see the author of the book that animates the dolls. His wife steals it, and after a series of lengthy events, the book winds up in the hands of Hoffman from the last one, and that's where this series, I guess, excels? Taking a simple scenario that most movies would take about three minutes to tell, because they're not vital to the overall plot, and then drag them out to a full third of the movie's runtime. It then jumps to 1941 and we get a recap of the last film, and then finally catch up to the toy maker on the train he boarded at the ending of the last film. Just note that this is 40 minutes into the film, and everything leading up to this was basically just a story of how the book got into Hoffman's hands, which is really not even that important to anything at all. This is a movie called Revenge of Robert the Doll, and a full half of the film has nothing to do with him. And oh geez, they're still still going with this old age makeup thing, huh? We get a flashback scene and we get to see the toy maker without makeup, but I guess scratch that because he still has this ridiculous fake mustache. In 1941, he is helped by a secret agent with great acting abilities. Give me that fucking gun. Who's actually a bad guy and Robert finally does something in his own movie. The other dolls are killed, leading to this outstanding performance right here. <laughs> and then Robert kills a bunch more Nazis with that same taped on knife. They kill them all, and then the movie bounces to 2012, and we see Agatha setting up the events of the prologue of the first film. And since it says that the events of that film are three years later, that sets the main story of the first film officially in 2015. So that's correct. 
It's kind of weird because he restates that Agatha is his sister, but he's only alive because of the book, and this is 73 years after he's revived. And he was pretty old back then, which would make him around, I guess, 150 years old or something now. So how does he have a sister? She'd have to be immortal too for this to make any sense. If you say that he was about 60 years old back in 1939, and the, and the character looks like he's supposed to be much older, his parents would be at the youngest in their late 70s. I guess it could work if she's his half-sister and Amos's dad impregnated a much younger girl and Agatha was born back in the 1930s with a 60-year age difference between her and her brother. That would make her in her 70s here? I, I don't know, I think that that's stretching it, so let's just say that it's because these movies are stupid. At least we know that Rob will return, though. And yep, one more year later, although with how cheap that these are appear to be to make, I feel like they could probably put one of these things out every few months, we get Robert Reborn. This one starts off with showing the story of Robert the little boy and his doll, because this is a real doll that little boys would have. I mean, wouldn't you buy this thing for your kid? We then bounce to Russia in 1951, 10 years after the events of the last film. The toy maker's back, and they've really scaled back the makeup, so he no longer looks like he's wearing cotton candy on his face, but it's still incredibly unconvincing. There's two new puppets, part of his stage act, an act that features Robert brandishing his knife at the audience. And but now there's Ms. Cyclops and Kalashnikov. Is Robert a good guy now? I mean, he was like pure evil in the first two, but I, I guess now he's only evil to Nazis? The Russians try to get the book to revive Stalin, and he's kidnapped once again. And once again, the dolls go killing to save him, and this guy's death is really, really convincing. It's not a train this time though, it's a plane, completely different, and it turns out that there's also a spell to reverse the resurrection, which I guess only works on one person, because Reading it aloud doesn't affect anyone else. I mean, all the puppets and the toy maker were revived using the book, and they all hear the reversal spell, so I guess it's more specific than just hearing it? There's a pretty decent plane crash scene that I'm guessing is stock footage. I mean, the plane doesn't really look 1951-ish, though. Although, what do I know about airplanes? And the dolls kill some random British officers, so I guess they're not really good guys. And then the toy maker cuts this guy's throat, but Somehow, he has blood on the side of his neck before the knife gets there. It ends with the gang on the loose, but this contradicts the final scene of the last film, in which Amos is still very much a good character, with no traces of the evil turn he takes in this one. Which leads me to believe that we're going to see more of these things, I guess, showing his redemption. And looking at the credits, here's a quick behind-the-scenes note. There's this guy named Kevin McLeod who supplies free music for videos. I use his music in a lot of my videos, and he's fantastic. I mean, he puts his videos up there, and he only asks for credit in return for using them. You don't usually see his music in a full-on production, though, because you'd have to make his songs fit your film instead of creating a song to fit it. Every single piece of music in this film is from Kevin. Every one. I guess I'm just pointing this out to show you exactly how cheap these things really are. So there you have it, it's five movies. Um, how bad could they be? They're pretty bad. Um, they're not like painfully bad. If anything, they're more painfully boring. Um, there's a lot of nonsense things that happen just to pad out runtime. Uh, the, they're all extremely cheap. The continuity seems to work somewhat well. I mean, there's some pretty glaring errors, especially with the ages of the characters. There's really no way to reconcile the Amos and Agatha age thing. Um, but at least they kind of uh, knew their dates, uh, I guess. Uh, the big contradiction of whether or not Amos is a good guy or a bad guy is uh, another big error that they made. Uh, so obviously there's some things that don't make sense, uh, but it like, makes more sense than the Puppet Master movies? I don't know. These aren't really worth watching. I guess if you wanted to watch the first one, you could just if you wanted to see a cheap child's play knockoff or an annabelle knockoff because that's literally all it is um it's somewhat amusing but overall not very well made uh not very well told um these aren't great so i would probably stay away from them 
Um, but that's it for this week's video. Let me know how you think that this is going, this whole how bad could it be experiment. Um, there's going to be quite a few more of them. I'm watching them and making these videos as fast as I can for you guys to entertain everybody during this quarantine time and also to entertain myself. Um, but, you know, please like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Check out the patrons over here. These guys are helping support the channel in this time of need. Um, and I thank them all for it very, very much. And I thank you guys for watching and sticking with me through this whole process. And I'll see you very, very shortly for another great video. Thanks, guys. Bye.